there's a clear link between mental strength and the ability to not only find a job, but also to keep a job. Something very similar can be seen in institutions that offer higher education. Those students who have good mental strength are far more likely to get good grades and complete their studies, whereas those lacking in mental strength are far more likely to drop out along the way. End quote, Greg Swanson. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. I know your time is precious, so we're going to get right into today's show. In today's show, the big idea is Coach Greg Swanson, a clinical hypnotherapist, neurolinguistic programming practitioner, life strategies coach, certified personal trainer, MMA coach, guerrilla marketing coach, and firewalking facilitator. Without further ado, I want to bring on Coach Greg Swanson to the Sports Mastery Podcast Show. Coach Swanson, tell us what you're up to and tell us a little bit more about your business. Deshaun, thank you so much. Well, first, I want to really appreciate you reaching out and touch base with me. You're doing some great, great work, and and uh, I'm proud to be a part of this uh, this podcast. It's wonderful. So I just wanted to reach out and say thank you. I appreciate it, man. So some of the things that I do, amongst other things that you've listed there, I, I look at myself as a mental strength expert. Part of that is because mental strength, when we look at self-mastery, whether it's in schools, whether it's in work, whether it's in sports, self-mastery, it all has to start with the mind. At least that's my position on it. And when we can develop our mental strength, we can accomplish basically almost anything. And so that's where my focus is on. And I'm out here in beautiful Bend, Oregon, right down the street from you. That's very correct, man. I found you on iTunes, as you know. And then as I was going through your profile on your website and everything, I realized that you were in Ben. And I'm like, man, this would be incredible to get somebody on, you know, of your caliber in my own backyard. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny how the universe connects us, right? It really is. I want to say to the audience, if you're here, I know why. This is no hijinks, no shenanigans, or boring, run-of-the-mill, dry-ass presentations. When you come on to Sports Mastery, I find the best possible guests out there in the world to deliver some very valuable information. Today, we're going to get into our discussion with Coach Swanson. I want to discuss the art and practice of self-improvement, Coach, and I wanted to really pick your brain and see what your thoughts were on that. Wow, that is fantastic. And that's an interesting concept, right? Self-improvement, that term itself. And you'll throughout this interview, you'll you may notice that I'll I'll pick up on certain words because one of the things that I have a really strong belief in is that words create, they don't describe. So as we are telling a story, as we're talking about something, we're actually creating that in our mind, that that event, and then we react to it. So the key word there is self-improvement. Improvement means there's a presupposition that there's something wrong with us if we have to improve. So I like personal development, personal growth, those type of things. And so it's not to criticize your word self-improvement, but I think when we look at improving ourselves, we automatically think there's something wrong with ourselves. But with the art and practice of it, it's to look at ourselves and appreciate what we have, right? So we look at a SWOT analysis, right? We look at our strengths, our weaknesses, the opportunities out there, and the threats. And the threats are more, if we look at it from a self-improvement perspective, our threats are those things inside of us. What is keeping us back from achieving our highest goal? And so we, we combine those opportunities, those weaknesses are also those things that are holding us back. And when we can do a complete SWOT analysis on ourselves, we then will be able to create this art. And the art is, and I love the way you, you, you phrase that, the art and practice, because the art is creative. It means it's your own. It's personal. It's not picking up a book. And doing what the book says and trying to force yourself into the book, although books are wonderful, podcasts like this are great. But what it involves is taking those things. It's like a buffet table. You take what you can use and leave the rest. And that's the art. And then the practice is doing that particular exercise, if you will, over and over and over again and realize that there is no failure, only feedback. And so life is a practice. It's not a perfect. Doctors have a practice. They don't have a per perfect. So self-improvement needs to have a practice, not a perfect. Man, I agree 100%. You know, it's interesting. Parents, coaches, 
athletes, if you're listening to this, you have to remember that words carry power. And what Coach Swanson is discussing here is that we can say self-improvement, but the better word and the better energy is personal development. And sometimes athletes, you have to listen when when parents are trying to help you and coaches are trying to help you. If they might say self-improvement, we're really discussing personal development. So keep that in mind. Coach Swanson, playing the victim. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, it's happened in life. I've played the victim before. You know, um, you've probably done it before. Sometimes we like to blame, complain and defend. What are your thoughts on people that play the victim or how to get past that? Wow, Deshaun, you've hit on a big subject for me as more recently in my coaching Um, career and talking with friends, it's so obvious that so many of us have been programmed by news, by commercials, by other things to play the victim. And that means not taking responsibility for our life, not taking responsibility for our results, and not taking responsibility in how we respond to them. So we can be an event where let's just say we get into a car accident, gosh forbid. I'm not saying that that it's an accident, but we can control how we respond to that accident. And if we go, this person made me feel bad. Now my day is ruined. Now we're playing the victim. And the victim disempowers us. And when we start to play the victim, and it's so easy, you're right, Deshaun, it's so easy to slip into this victim mentality, this victim mode, because we just kind of go, well, the rain isn't here or the rain is here, so I can't play on the field and my coach isn't here. And we and we start giving our power away to external events external people. And when we do that, we play the victim. And when we play the victim, we give away our power so we can't change that. So part of it is looking what you can do. So there's a, there's a great book out called The Oz Principle, and it's based on The Wizard of Oz, and it's mainly for business. But they talk about accountability and moving from the victim to the, I will call it the warrior. Their question that people ask, they ask themselves is, what else can I do to rise above my circumstances to get the results that I want? You want to know something, coach? And I want to say this again, athletes, parents, coaches, if you're listening to this, the big takeaway over the last couple of minutes when, you, when you're listening to Coach Swanson is that when you play the victim, you disempower yourself. And when you play the victim, you take away opportunity. When you play the victim, you put yourself in a position of less than. You put yourself in a subservient position. So keep that in mind. Let's get away from blaming, complaining and defending, you know, behaviors that aren't conducive to you being successful or enhancing your personal development. Exactly. And I, just, I just want to give one example. I mean, it's from a sports example. I think OTAs or mini camps started a couple of weeks ago. Well, I know they did. And there yes. was a gentleman who was going to Buffalo, who is, I don't think he was a rookie, but he was a vet veteran going to Buffalo and he was trying to get a connecting flight through Chicago. Well, his connection flight was canceled. It would have been very easy for him to call the coach and go, hey, listen, my flight got canceled. I can't make it. You know what he did, right? You remember the story. He rented an Uber and rented an Uber that drove him from Chicago to Buffalo for over 350 bucks. He gave him, I think, a 300 buck tip, but he did what it was necessary. He rose above his circumstances to get the results he wants. So that's the same thing with any young athletes here. If your parents can't drive you to practice, get on a bicycle, get on a skateboard, get on a scooter, call up your friends, take public transportation, do whatever it takes to get the results that you want. You know what, man, I'm glad you mentioned that last part, take public transportation, because I'm in the city here and I've also heard the the excuses. I don't have a ride. My mom couldn't take me. Get on the bus. Get on the max. You know, uh, and I've heard that Portland, Oregon has like the best like public transportation system in the country. So um, there's no excuse when you're listening to Coach Swanson not to make it, especially in, in the city that we live in. You know, um, I want to transition to the (laughs) F-bomb. I want to transition to the F-bomb. And I'm talking about fear. Yep. Real life fear. 
So what's, what's been your practice on fear and how you've helped athletes in the past and how you've seen that hold people back and then be, be able to get past those fears? Right. So there, there is this fear or there's this danger that we can face. So if we're out walking in the jungle and a lion comes around, we can have it. It's dangerous. And that type of danger and fear is, is good for us. It's healthy. It keep, keeps us alive. But what happens with many athletes uh, and just other folks, we have fear. And what this fear is, is mentally rehearsing an outcome that we don't want. So we've all heard these silly little things, fear, what fear stands for and stuff. But fear really is the anticipation of pain. So if we look at anticipating, that means we are thinking about creating a result that we don't want. And it's all, here's the key, it's a story. It's just a story we're telling ourselves. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to drop the ball. I'm afraid I'm not going to get picked. I'm afraid this. I'm a- All it's a story. You can create the same thing. It's a 50% story for fear or it's a 50% story of empowerment. You can say, you know what? I'm going to get picked. I am going to get picked. I'm going to catch that ball. I'm going to run. I'm going to hit the ball. Right? So the fear, we have to understand that fear is mentally rehearsing an outcome that we don't want. Now sit with that for a little bit and think about it because you have a choice. It's your thoughts. You're controlling them. You can have a thought of fear or you can have a thought of empowerment. And that is realizing an outcome. So what I usually do with clients is I, you know, if they come to me and they're afraid of something, oh, I'm afraid I'm not going to get the job. I'm afraid I'm not going to be picked for the team. I go mentally rehearse what the successful outcome that you want. Two minutes after that successful outcome, how are you going to feel? And they go, oh, I feel great. I feel happy. I'm going, great. Then continue to do that because that's the opposite of fear, right? You're mentally rehearsing an outcome that you do want. I think it's re- very interesting some of the things that you were discussing earlier. And then when, we're, when we get to the subject of fear, it's okay to make mistakes, It's okay to fail. It's okay to start something and maybe it doesn't work out. But the important thing is what can you learn from it and then accept responsibility for your actions and then you can get better and move on past your fear. And I've heard it in the past. I'm sure you've heard this, coach. If you fear something, go do the thing that you fear so then you can get past that. If you're scared of heights, go go to the top of a building and look off. Do you have any other examples of that in terms of facing your fears? Wow. I mean, there are so many, Deshaun, and you're right. It's when we look at it, we're many times we're afraid to do something. And here's the thing is, as we get older, as people put more pressure on us. So like when we're really young, we're going to go out there and try anything. We're going to ride the bike. We're going to try to jump on a trampoline. We're going to try to do whatever. And we're never, we never even think about failing. Although all we've done in the beginning is fail, but we haven't failed and quit. We failed and learned and kept on going. But the challenge is as I'm going to just say more pressure, although pressure is only external. There's no, I mean, it's only internal. There is no external pressure. But the more we accept that people expect more from us, we don't want to let them down. This is very true with young athletes. We don't want to let our parents down. We don't want to let our team down. We don't want to. So we're afraid to attempt something because if we attempt something new, we're going to let them down and we own that part of it. But what you said is very powerful is that when we can, do an action, get the result, analyze it and say, hey, there's no failure. There's only feedback and then correct and continue and move on and move on. That will help eliminate that fear. But we have to understand where that fear comes from in order to slay that dragon. And often it's a story that we make up. You know, that's incredible, man. It's almost like the athlete or the team that stays at a lower level because they want to win. They're used to winning and now they're afraid to go up as far as like the pressure of losing and how that might feel. And here's something and here's something really, really interesting because we just talked about victim and fear. When somebody is really, really embracing the victim mentality. They are often afraid of succeeding because then who would they be if they succeed? They wouldn't be the victim anymore. So they are afraid of succeeding, so they fail to play the victim. Makes perfect sense because when you start to succeed, you get more responsibility and then you have to step it up more. 
Right. And then, then who are you? So if we identify with the victim at an unconscious level and we start to succeed, all of a sudden we're not the victim, but we don't have, we don't have the ability except through podcasts like yourself and coaches like yourself. Generally speaking, athletes don't have the ability to embrace a new identity to replace that victim. So this is where the fear, so there's going to be a fear of success and a fear of failure. That's incredible, man. You know what you were reading my mind because you get stuck in the identity, you know, and then sometimes even athletes, they just identify with being athletes. But no, you're actually a student, too. And there's going to be a career after sports. You know, one day the ball's going to stop bouncing. The crowd's going to go away. You're not going to be able to kick a soccer ball or get on the hardwood uh, court, or, you know, or, or the football season ends. You know what I mean? Yep, exactly. And that and that's, you know, that's a side top topic is that identity. I am an athlete. I am a student. No, you're more than that. Anybody who's more than that, you're more than, you know, an interviewer. You're more than a coach yourself, Deshaun, and you realize that and embrace it. But that's also where fear comes in. If people, especially young players, identify with what they do, there's a lot of fear that's going to come up if I'm not successful, if I don't get to a D1 school. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to be good enough or whatever it might be. So they have identified with their role in sports as opposed to who they are as a person. And that also drives a lot of fear. You know what? That whole D1 thing, that, that could be a whole episode between me and you right there, man. <laughs> I'm not going to digress. <laughs> Let's talk about leadership development, coach, and, and in how you, what systems and strategies do you use to help the young student athlete or the, or the CEO or, the, or, or, any, or anybody that you're working with to increase that, to become more? Well, it's, that's a great question. And it's, and it's all unique. And again, there's a lot of great books out there about that. But part of leadership development, and I'm, I'm reading a book now by Navy SEAL, it's called Extreme Ownership. And that's one of the key things that I've been coaching with folks, with leaders on, whether it's small business owners or athletes, is that they have to own their own results, right? So it's the leadership development is the opposite of victim mentality. And they have to own it. And if you're a coach, you have to own the results of your entire team. It's you who's doing it. If you're a player, you have to own the results of your specific position. It's not the quarterbacks. It's not the pitcher's fault. It's not anything. You have to own it. And that's part of being a leader. And then as being a leadership development is not that we're all that important, but be aware that people are watching you and how, how you behave says a lot about yourself. And that's a leader will behave in a certain way, whether people are watching them or not, although we're always being watched. And leadership development, right? You have to be able to lead yourself first before you can lead other people. Yes, I agree 100%. So just remember with the leadership development, playing the victim, getting over fear, it all goes back to accepting responsibility. It all goes back to that. One thing I wanted to discuss with you, Coach Greg, is the importance of imagery and visualization. What are some of your thoughts on that for the student athlete? Wow. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And again, I'm just going to change the words to mental rehearsal. Yes, sir. Because as we become adults, and this is, this is really important. I think that in here, this particular change of words is critical. Because if you asked a young athlete, maybe, you know, 14, 15, 16 to do imagery, they would only create an image. But mental rehearsal creates a kinesthetic feeling. It creates a visual. It creates an auditory. It creates full sensory. So when you're mentally rehearsing shooting a free throw, you feel what the ball would feel like. You hear it bouncing on the free throw line. You feel your knees dip. You feel the ball raising up. You watch the ball go into the hoop. So it's a full, full sensory. Because with imagery, most people, and this has been my experience when I work with clients, and this do doesn't have to be in sports either. You could do mental rehearsal of going for a job interview, mental rehearsal of taking a test. You want to see yourself sitting down at the desk, being calm and collective. You feel the pencil in your hand, if they still use pen pencils these days at tests. <laughs> <laughs> or you see yourself at the keyboard, right? And you feel your fingers on the keyboard and you see the screen. You completely immerse yourself in this mental rehearsal. And it is critical. It is absolutely essential. And Deshaun, what blows my mind is 
you'll talk to parents and they'll know it's important. You'll talk to athletes and there's enough pro athletes out there that talk the importance of mental strength and imagery and mental rehearsal. And yet they only spend one or two minutes, if that, a week, a month on it. Yet they will go out there and move their and do their technical drills and their conditioning drills two to three hours a day, but they won't work on their mind for about one minute. You know what's interesting, man, and and I also reflect on my youth as far as coming up playing sports, football, baseball, basketball, is that when we were younger, if nobody was out and if, if I found myself in the backyard, is just playing the game by myself. I think that's where it starts for great athletes, where they imagine making the winning shot or scoring the winning touchdown or throwing that pass or making the tackle or, or jumping over the obstacles or shaking defenders. I just remember like naturally doing that in my youth. But then how does that go? Why do we go away from that as we get older, older like it's not cool? You, you know what I mean? Yep. yep. And so what what you did was perfect. And what happens is if we're not interfered with as individuals, let's just say golf, let's just say you're, you're, you go out to golf and you're on the putting green at a practice green and you're saying, okay, it's at the masters, your tie at the 18th hole. And if you make this, you, you win and you, you're visualizing it. Well, what happens is when you do it during your practice, you'll be able to do it in your performance. And what happens is coaches and parents what would the problem is they think that it just takes two minutes of mental practice to change a lifetime of bad behavior or a, ba- or a lifetime of bad techniques. And they don't understand that it, however long it took somebody to develop a technique, it's going to take that long to develop a mental habit. So many coaches, one, don't believe in it still these days as, the, as mental rehearsal. There are some great coaches out there that do, but there's a lot of them in the D1 and high school that think they know what they're saying about it, but in actuality, aren't really working with their students to do that. Because if they don't do it during practice, right? If a coach really believes that it's that important, they would take five minutes at the beginning or five minutes at the end of every practice and have the entire team mentally rehearse something but they don't do it. So they don't really believe in it. If they did, they'd be doing it. So what they're doing is they're telling the kids by not giving it attention, they're saying it's not important. And so then kids, whether it's again, high school, D1, or even getting into uh, a major team as a rookie, they have been taught by not doing it that it's not important. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm not even going to say anything else. I'll let you have that right there, coach. <laughs> you know, as as we get into the fourth quarter, <laughs> that being said, what is one piece of advice that you'd give to a sport coach? Wow. So this is really, I mean, this is a fantastic question, Deshaun, and it's probably one that could be answered in multiple directions. But here's what I'm going to say, and it's probably going to catch you and many people by surprise. Increase their vocabulary. The reason I say that is coaches, when you give cues, so let's just say that a coach was talking to their team about colors, but all they knew in their vocabulary was red, blue, black, and green. Well, you know, and I know there are so many variations on that. How are you able to get your your athlete or the person li- listening to you to understand the nuances in the colors? That's the same thing with coaching. You have to have a bigger vocabulary as opposed to saying, keep your eye on the ball, swing straighter. These are commands. These aren't coaching. And most coaches just dictate. But if they had a larger vocabulary to explain the result they want, they would be able to articulate that to the students better. For instance, there's a great example. I think keep your eye on the ball is probably a universal coaching quote Q, right? If it worked, right. if it worked, it would work all the time, but it hasn't worked because we still use it. So why are we still using a coaching Q that doesn't work because they don't know what else to say? So for instance, and I, and this is not an increase in vocabulary, but it's how to use the words differently. Let's say you're a volleyball coach and a player keeps missing the ball. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the ball. Well, duh, they're trying to play. They would keep their eye on the ball. But then you ask them, What way is the ball spinning when it comes towards you? Ah, you don't care which way it's spinning, but the player has to watch the ball in order to know which way it's spinning. Right. 
And so when we can change the vocabulary for coaches to change the vocabulary and give different cues because each person is different. Yes, I know as a team, we have to tell the bigger picture of it. But when you start to work, if you, if as this gets back to leadership development, if you as the coach are responsible for the results of the entire team and you have players that aren't up to that particular level, you need to work with them independently. And when you work with them independently, you have to adjust your communications so that they understand what you're saying. It's not them. And this is some, something from NLP is that the response you get is the meaning of your communication. So that means that you as the coach has to own the responsibility of communicating to your players so that they understand. And so I would say the biggest thing for coaches is to learn maybe a more diverse vocabulary and how to change up their communication. Parents, coaches, if you're listening to this, we have to expand our vocabulary. We have to learn new words. And what that does, it enhances your cueing of what you're trying to teach. Now, uh, Coach Swanson, I can remember particular going back to high school, playing baseball. I used to bat lead off and you always hear that. Keep your eye on the ball. And then one day I got a cue from my coach. He said, you know, when he's starting to wind up, I want you to widen your eyes like they're the size of quarters. You know, mm -hmm. and it, 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 that was one little cue that helped me. And I started doing it. And I remember certain things to this day, widen your eyes, you know, to, you know, you might get an extra second before you might blink because the facts show that you do lose track of the ball at some point. Right. But, but, but the key there though is right is, is one opening your eyes wide reduces the amount of fear you have as well. There's a, there's a connection between your eyes and your, your parasympathetic nervous system. So when you're fearless, so let's just say you're leading off and you got this fear about striking out or whatever, your visions would become very narrowly focused and you're not going to be able to see things as clearly as keeping your eyes as wide as quarters. So that was a great cue. Yeah. What's one of your favorite quotes, coach? Wow. I, 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 for me, it would be one of the um, – every facet, every compartment of your mind is to be programmed by you. And if you don't take your rightful responsibility and begin to program your own mind, the world will program it for you. Wow, that's incredible. I'll, I'll have to quote that. We'll, we'll put that into a PDF or something. Right. And the key, the key there is, again, taking responsibility. It gets back to what you talked about with being the, the victim. If we allow people to put into us limiting beliefs, doubts, fear, we are giving them our power. And this quote is all about taking back that power ourselves. You want to know something, man. Uh, and, you know, it's in the Bible. I'm, I'm not very religious. I did grow up in the church when I was younger. But, mm -hmm. you know, on my on, on my whiteboard, it just says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find and knock and it shall be open. And, and I relate that to how I met you. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been turned down. You know, um, I feel like your podcast wouldn't be a good fit for me right now. Sometimes I don't hear from people, but I'm like, you know, it's a numbers game. Yeah. So I wasn't worried when I reached out to you. I didn't have have an emotional attachment. Either person's going to say yes or no, they're going to respond or not. And you know, and you keep trying and then you reached out to me and we got on here fairly quick when you consider our interaction starting last week, man. Yep. So, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this out here, all, sometimes all you have to do is just do the work and just go forward and do it. You know, yep. and great things will happen for you. If you follow your passion and you follow, you know, follow your heart, what I would say is things will connect. And when I got just a side note, when I got the note from Deshaun, I looked at it and it was just like, great, let's let's do this. There wasn't I didn't do the whole bunch of background. I just tr I trusted my instincts and my feeling immediately. And here we are. Incredible. Coach, before we close out, what are three book recommendations for uh, for the student athlete or the or the coach and the uh, and the parent? Wow. So okay. So one one of them, it's maybe more for the parent or for a more mature athlete, and that's uh, by Dr. Joe Dispenza, and it's called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Dr. Joe Dispenza goes into some neuroscience and talks about our addiction to our emotions and how those addictions feed our emotions, which feed our thoughts. So if we're addicted to drama, we're going to create drama in our mind. So those chemicals get released and then we're going to create drama in our life. Um, so that that is one, one good one. Another one is, and I forgot the author right now. He just 
passed away, Coaching for Performance, which is great for parents and for teachers. Um, and that's a, that's a fascinating one as well. And then, wow, you know. What about one of yours? Well, of course. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was trying to be, you know, I, I, on these podcasts, I try not to be too self-promoting because, you know, then it turns people off. So I appreciate you met you mentioning that. So I, I have two, I have several books out there, but I have one, Mental Strength and Athletic Performance, which I'm very, very proud of. It's both on Kindle and on Amazon. Are they hard copies on Amazon? They are Kindle, but if you go okay. to Create Space which is a company that is owned by Amazon, you can order a hard copy there. And of course, if anybody needs any information, we'll, I'll give my contact out in a little bit. But also, there, I also have a book, Develop the Mental Strength of a Warrior, and as well as an online course, which I think would be, would be the foundation for anybody, coach, parent, or athlete, to develop that mental strength to continue and persevere through challenging um, situations. Excellent, man. Uh, so you, you, we already started going down that rabbit hole, but where can my audience find you and learn more? Well, first of all, I appreciate you letting me, again, be on the podcast and helping you with your message. And my website is warriormindcoach.com. I do most of my my uh, activities on the blog. So it's warriormindcoach.com forward slash blog. In there, you'll be able to see some articles that I've written. Uh, you'll be able to get on to access my podcast, send me a contact information if you can't find the books, but that's that's the best way. I'm also active on LinkedIn and fa Facebook. And all you got to do is a search for uh Warrior Mind Coach or Greg Swan Swanson, and you'll be able to find me with, with pretty much very ease. Excellent. You heard it here first with Coach Greg Swanson. Coaches, it's finally here. A workbook for athletes designed by athletes. Something that's going to help you help your student athlete develop their leadership skills. Something that's going to help you help your student athlete develop character development. Along with that, we have chapters that's going to help the student athlete define and overcome fear. It isn't for the student athlete to do by themselves. It's for the parent to assist the student athlete. It's for the coach to assist the student athlete and bridge the gap in communication. To learn more, visit sportsmastery.com slash buy workbook. If you have any personal questions, drop me an email, drop me a line at Deshaun, D-E-S-H-A-W-N at sportsmastery.com. Peace and blessings.